Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Happy Hour. I'm your host, Chris Wright. Um, today, I'm really excited. Um, every time I get a new person to interview, I get excited. Um, but the question is, do you ever think about real estate investing other than buying, let's say, a, a primary home, but you just don't know where to start? You know, how do I find the money? Do I buy a single family or do I buy, buy a multifamily? You know, do I buy a fixer upper cheap or buy something moving ready? You know, do I buy a multifamily with tenants or something empty? What does cap mean? <laughs> you know, um, and how does cap have a bearing on my investment? Uh, what does net cash flow mean? You know, I don't know. It's like, you know, do I use a traditional loan or do I use my savings? There's hard money out there. And what is hard money? Do I pull money from my home equity loan or use a 401k? All those questions, you know, come about in your brain when you think about um, investing in real estate. Um, so in this exclusive interview, we're going to dive deep into this world of real estate with Giovanni Lisi. His name is synonymous with success in the property market, has a staggering portfolio of over 70 units, valued at $6 million plus, and he built all of this in like 3.5 years. Um, he's like a beacon for, you know, for aspiring and seasoned real estate agents. Um, and, and, and then balancing his dynamic career as a full-time real estate agent as well. And I know that's tough. I've tried to multitask and do other things, um, but he's doing the one thing, which is real estate. He's just doing in multiple ways. And uh, Giovanni, he's going to share his strategies, challenges, and triumphs of his journey. He's going to, you know, from his first leap into the market to mastering the art of buying and flipping properties. Um, and this conversation is more than just an interview. It's kind of a masterclass. So uh, whether you're looking to make your first investment or scale your existing portfolio, uh, Giovanni's insights and experiences are the keys to unlocking your potential in the real estate arena. arena. We're going to talk to him right after this. This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. It's a fun place where we talk real estate, pop culture, and what's trending. Hey, I might even give you some good advice. So grab yourself a drink, sit back, relax, and take a listen. Unless you're driving, of course. I'll see you guys on the other side. All right. This show is sponsored by my team today, the Chris Wright team, Oxford Property Group. Uh, Brenda and I, we started a team a, a couple months ago, and we've just been locked and loaded, excited. We're ready to help you buy and sell. I'm going to learn from Giovanni about investment property, so maybe he can help us do that as well. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to him. And um, yeah, let's kick, kick this uh, interview off. Giovanni, how's it going, brother? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me, Chris. 100%. 100%. So, you know, let's get right into it. Well, first of all, how's your family? How's your friends? How's everybody doing in your life? It's going good. We're, uh, we're getting ready for uh, actual spring here. I think we had a fall spring for a few weeks, and now uh, hopefully there's no snow in the next few days. So Great, great. So, let you know, I'll, I'll kick off by asking you, um, do, you have a, do you have a company name? What's the name of your company? Uh, yeah, so we got our called for our investment side, the Capital Region uh, Rental Group. Um, and we've, me and my business partner, Sean Daly, who is a local CPA, uh, started that about three and a half years ago. That's when we started buying our first handful of properties. And then I also have my real estate license full time as a real estate agent. I'm actually just starting uh, my own team here soon. And there should be an announcement on the way, which I'm excited to share over awesome. the next few days. That's great. Can't wait to hear the news. Um, so when you first got into this, you know, what was your primary goal for investing in, 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 in uh, rental properties, multifamily homes? Were you looking for cash flow, appreciation, a little bit of both? Were you thinking about retirement? What was the goal initially? Yeah, for me, it was to build financial freedom. Um, that's my initial goal when me and Sean sat down about well, going on three and a half years ago, right? And uh, Basically, back then, that was my goal is to create some financial freedom. Prior to that, I knew I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do real estate full time as an agent or I wanted to get a nine to five job. But I knew I'd have at least you know one or two rental properties in my portfolio. You know, if that was the route I was going to go, just to diversify myself, you know, in a different ways of, of investing. So great. Now, three and a half years is not a long time. Uh, there's people who've been doing this for 15, 20 years. How did you ramp up so fast? I mean, what were, you, you were focused, man. What, what were you doing? 
Yeah. Uh, I'd say the number one thing is to have mentors, right? To have people in your corner that you can bounce ideas off of that motivate you and uplift you. Uh, mm -hmm. That has helped me not only as an investor, but a full-time real estate agent. Um, and I also would say for us, it was leveraging private money, um, using other people's money to help scale our portfolio, giving them a return on their investment that was fair to them. And just, uh, it's a snowball effect after that point. So. I've heard of that using other people's money. <laughs> People have asked, like, how do I get started? And that's a good way to do it. Now, um, people are going to want to know this. Do you, um, do you have specific markets or neighborhoods that you focus on? How do you go about finding the right place to invest? Yeah, we like to keep everything close. So most of my properties are uh, situated, I call it the 787 corridor, um, mm -hmm. from anywhere from Waterville, uh, be anywhere in between, all the way up north to Mechanico. So um we keep things very close. Majority of our portfolio is in the city of Cohoes as we speak right now. Do you keep things close because it's easier to maintain, easier to work on, you know, repairs and keep your contractors close? Is there a particular reason you keep things tight? Yeah, exactly that. No, I want it to be easy to manage and I don't want to have my guys drive from, you know, let's call it uh, Waterfleet all the way out to Amsterdam, right? I want to be able to keep it in one spot. Um, for service calls. And, you know, my mentors once taught me, you know, to keep things close. And I kind of modeled after that. So. Yeah, I, I've heard investors say the same thing. In fact, even a lot of times when people come from downstate and they want to invest in this area, they focus on one area at a time. So they only want to buy properties in Troy or buy properties in Amsterdam. But that's the way they, you know, tend to do it. Is So you guys must all be learning the same thing, right? So yeah, more so. Yeah. And it makes it easy to acquire new properties, right? I can focus on one area and not yeah. drive myself crazy when I prospect. Cool, cool. Um, let's talk about the financing because this is where everybody, everyone has a question. Where do I get money? So um, how do you, how, other than other people's money, are there other ways that you know that other investors do um, to finance their investments? Do they consider conventional mortgages, hard money, 401ks, home equity loans? What, what have you seen? Yeah. So there's a, a few ways, right? Um, there's a difference between hard money and private money. Private money tends to be friends and family or people that you know and trust already. Um, hard money, you can get, you know, you can speak to a mortgage lender. They'll have access to hard money depending on who they are. Um, hard money usually is institutional backed or a group or conglomerate pools other people's money together and has the ability to lend that money out uh, under one shingle. And usually hard money uh, has more points. It's a little bit more expensive as far as an interest rate and there's more fees involved. So that's why I like to stick with private money. I can kind of create my own rules and regulations, you know, amongst my friends and family, as long as we're in a mutual agreement and then conventional FHA financing, or if you're super rich and you have your own cash then feel free and invest it. Right. So those are the multiple ways. So what about leveraging existing properties? Do you ever decide yes. to sell a property and then buy a new property? Yeah. And we have not done that yet in our portfolio. We've kept everything pretty much that we've purchased. Um, but with that being said, a lot of people will you know, do a home equity line of credit, right? To get their start, whether they use that towards a down payment on their next investment property, mm -hmm. or um, they may have a property that's been paid off free and clear, right? And they can do it that way. Uh, another way would just be, uh, yeah, you know, you could do a 1031 exchange. You know, there's very, very uh, multiple facets to acquire real estate. Uh, property management. Um, do you plan to manage? Do you pro manage the properties yourself, or do you have a property management company that you hire? Uh, so we have our own property management company, and okay. that is something that manages our entire portfolio. Uh, and we have a few people that are subcontractors that work for us under that property management company that helps streamline things like handyman, contractors, leasing agents. Um, so it makes it easy. Not only do we manage our own portfolio, but I'll take on a select few of my own personal clients who are looking to uh, have their portfolio managed as long as they're looking to grow with me and uh, grow their portfolio as well. So how do you, um, how do you measure risk tolerance, especially when you have so many units, how do you realize that, okay, this property was a risk. We probably shouldn't have bought that. And how do you kind of like minimize that risk? What, what type of things have you, cause I'm sure you've learned a lot of lessons. So talk to me about what's higher risk and what's lower risk, especially for new investors. Yeah. For us, when we go into a deal, we want to have three outs. I want to be able to get out of that deal in three different ways. Okay. So when I look for a property, I look at for properties that need value add stuff that I can add value to, whether it's increase the rents by, um, you know, doing updates or you know, boosting up the overall curb appeal of the property in order to add value. Right. 
And basically for us, it's the first out would be, all right, we can buy it and we bought it right. So we can flip it tomorrow and make a profit on it just because we bought it right. Mm -hmm. Or we can go ahead and add that value by doing those repairs, renovations and get those rents up and then flip the property. Or we ultimately, and our ultimate goal is to buy and hold it and keep it and refinance out and keep it in our portfolio. Um, so that's kind of how we measure things. As far as a risk tolerance standpoint, I want to make sure that I can pull 100% of our cash out. That's my number one rule. And the number two thing is to make sure that it does actually cash flow. So it's worth getting out of bed over and right. being able to make sure that that cash flow makes sense. Sounds like a plan. Now, you, I, I saw you on Facebook. You were live from a group. Is there like a, a group that, uh, you know, gets together and mix and talk about this type of thing? Was it like a, a class or something? Yeah, no, uh, we have a local investor meetup. It's a national RIA, Real Estate Investors Association. Mm -hmm. It's called the Capital Region Real Estate Investors Association. And it's every third Tuesday up in Clifton Park. We have a website as well. And I'm one of the co-owners of that organization. We have about 150 members that are subscribed to us. And about, I'd say on average, 100 people show up per month. What's it cost to join that? Uh, it's right around two ninety nine for the year for, for the an individual year, okay. membership. Yep. And do you have guest speakers and people come like that? Or how's that work? Yeah, each each month we have a guest speaker, uh, whether it's a local real estate investor who has success like myself, or um, next month we are doing a panel on Airbnb, actually. So oh. we are going to be talking about Airbnb. I actually think you did a uh, panel more recently on here as well. So I did. We were talking about some of the uh, laws and bylaws and um, policies and procedures of Saratoga Springs specifically but it does affect other places throughout the country. Um, I think the good thing about that is you, as you have these short-term rental groups and classes um, that they learn about the different zones and restrictions in different municipalities. So that's gonna be key coming up because uh, some cities are concerned that Airbnb, or I should say short-term rentals are growing and more of them than they ever anticipated are coming. So they have, they have to figure out right. how to regulate that. Um, yep. Do you prefer to buy, you know, renovations and upgrades or turnkey properties? Uh, renovations and upgrades. It's my name of the game. It works with our business model. And we use what is called the Burr method. Uh, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. I like that. What's it called again? The Burr method. B with four R's. Okay. Burr method, like cold, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so I have a book. I have two books. One's about flipping and one's about holding. Um, what do you prefer to hold or to um, flip? Uh, right now I'm doing a little bit of both. We uh, plan to hold, you know, especially our, our uh, investment properties. Um, but we've been averaging right around one to two flips a month as we speak. Okay. Um, and when you are holding, is there a certain profile? We know we have to be careful with uh, fair housing, but are there certain profiles that are less risky or more risky, like far as, you know, people that look in college area for student rentals, then this area for family rentals and their professional rentals, things like that. Is, is there a preference from a risk standpoint? Uh, for me overall, no. I think what's awesome about investing in real estate, there's so many options, so many variables that someone can get themselves into. Yeah. And none of them are wrong, as long as you're making money, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for us, you know, we, we take everything into consideration. Okay. How deep do you get into, you know, legal considerations like, you know, the legal aspects of renting properties such as leases, tenant rights, local regulations, because it changes so much. And if you're not up, up to, you know, date on the lo most local regulations, you can find yourself in a pickle. Do you stay up to date with that or do you have a lawyer or an attorney keep you abreast of that stuff? No, we definitely keep uh, an eye on it ourselves and do our research. But at the same time, on my lease standpoint, I'll update it every six months with our real estate attorney. Okay. All right. Do you have a group of attorneys or just specific ones you work with? Uh, just specific ones I work with. Okay. What about um, people worry about this or the tax implications of investments properties? Do you know, do you plan to consult with tax professionals on a regular basis, quarterly basis? How often do you sit with tax professionals? Every hour of the day, because my business partner is a CPA. <laughs> that's, that's a great partner to have. That's great. It awesome. Is. Um, you talked about exit strategy. Um, tell me a little, and I asked you this question in a different way, but tell me about a transition when you decide to sell what was once a rental. How do you make that decision? 
Yeah, I think it really comes down to a few factors and we're going to see it more and more. And I think we're going to see more investment type properties and commercial properties come to the market over the next few months. So a lot of commercial loans have a five year, 10 year balloon period, some sort of balloon with their commercial lender that either they need to refinance out or they need to go ahead and just reassess the mortgage and the loan on it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people's interest rates are going to be reset here very soon. And I think we're going to see some investors realize that either the cash flow wasn't what they expected as it was three, four, five years ago. Right. Um, and they're going to make a decision on whether you're going to sell or not. Um, so basically, um, you know, that is, a, you know, one factor that we have to analyze even on our growing portfolio. There might be a time where in the near future, some of the properties that we acquired three and a half years ago may make sense to cash out now while the market's up. Right. And we can pull that equity out and invest that maybe into a bigger property or a bigger piece of bigger piece of real estate. My game plan overall for me and my business partner is to grow it again for, you know, we want to hit 10 years as investors, you know, growing our portfolio. Um, so by the time I'm 35, let's say 32, 35 in that range, um, then we'll look to either refinance out using that equity and buying a larger apartment complex, or we may sell off our portfolio and do exactly that, buy that larger apartment complex or do like more ground up new construction on the investment space. So what, what are my, what should my cash flow expectations be for rental properties? Like how much net income? should I aim to generate monthly or annually? How, what's that look like? You definitely should be net positive. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> a lot of people, some people don't realize that some people right. maybe even buy as far as an appreciation play, like Saratoga is a tough market to be net positive in cash flow, but mm -hmm. um, because the property values are so expensive and you know, for a two family, you're spending $700,000 to get back the same amount of rent that I would in water Vliet or Cohoes. Granted, maybe you get more in rent, but still, you know, the, the expenses don't outweigh the, uh, or the expenses outweigh the return. But with that being said, I would say for us in the markets that we invest in, Water Vliet and Cohoes, mm -hmm. um, we are averaging, you know, right around at minimum uh, $500 a month in positive net cash flow after all expenses and anywhere up to, you know, $2,000 a month. It really depends on the property and, and uh, the expenses on it. So a lot of first time investors, they, uh, they juggle or struggle with, should I occupy the property? Knowing that if you buy, let's say a two family and you rent one unit out and I live in the other unit, that's, that could be 12 to $1,500, maybe more of income that you could be getting. What do, what do you, what do you advise people do? Do you advise them to occupy the property or, or, or create a situation where they don't have to? Yeah. For as investor or someone looking to start getting into the investment space, I highly recommend owner occupying an investment property first. Okay. First off, it tells you if you like being a landlord, because being a landlord is not for everyone. Um, it also, it helps, especially in today's day and age with how interest rates are as we speak, it helps with going ahead and being able to offset your housing expense. And you know, it, you could basically, instead of paying someone else rent, why don't you pay it towards a mortgage where you're building that equity up and there's no better way of home ownership and creating some wealth that way. And I personally did that. I, my, my, I got into it a little bit later than most. I had some mentors behind me, so I was able to get into that burn method right away. Mm -hmm. I probably should have done an owner occupied investment property, but my story all worked itself out. But I ended up buying a owner occupied three family in Cohoes uh, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now. Right. And that property has been tremendous. I mean, today, you know, all my tenants are paid in full on that property. It's awesome. I'm seeing the rent money come in and now I can use it towards my mortgage on my single family house, right? And offset Excellent. those costs. And that property in itself, I've been able to build up, you know, a lot of equity on it. I've been able to, I was living there for free while also pocketing $1,300 a month. So it was an awesome property. So I'm sure you run into people and you, after talking to them for five minutes, you think you don't really know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> it has to happen. Cause I was wondering about like, um, you know, conducting market analysis, you know, for potential rental properties. And some people just don't know how to crunch the numbers to know if they're making a good investment or not. Like, do you have specific criteria to look for, for, for a newcomer? Uh, yeah, I would say, of course, your cash flow is important. I think that's the number one thing. People ask, oh, do you worry about cap rate? No, I worry about my cash flow. Cap rate, well, if the cash flow is there, the cap rate should check out. Um, so from there, it's just being able to make sure you're buying the right property at cash flows. And, uh, 
that's my advice overall. There's a lot of calculators online, but you know, the biggest thing too is don't get too caught up in the numbers because analysis paralysis is killer, right? Yes, Just a, like anything in life, um, go out and do it, you know, conquer it and uh, be confident in it first going into it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good calculators online for me on the method that I use the Burr method. I like to try to figure out, all right, what's the after repair value first? Mm -hmm. And then I go ahead and I subtract all my expenses, my repair costs, my holding costs, my closing costs, and then I derive at an offer price, right? That's the number that I am willing to offer because now I know I can pull hundred percent of my money out mm -hmm. based on, you know, factoring those, you know, repair and holding costs. That's interesting. So the big thing is, um, maintenance how do you uh, handle maintenance and repairs on your current rental properties do you have a budget set aside for unexpected expenses how do yeah you do that? so we we save about 15 percent of our rents uh or our incoming rent each month in a separate savings account mm -hmm. and we utilize that towards the repairs vacancy and uh, capital expenditures that need to be addressed okay. um, and then for us we have about six guys that are independent contractors that uh, handle our service calls and our, our handyman type work Okay. What about the specialists like uh, HVAC, plumbers, electricians? Do you have a group of those people that you work with on a regular basis? Yeah, they're, they're one of the six. They're one of the six. Okay, great. Awesome. So what about the um, occupancy rates? I heard about that. What are your expectations for occupancy? How do you measure that throughout the year? Yeah, we, we save for 5% on vacancy. And sometimes it depends on the property. That could be low, that could be high. Some properties I, that I own, they haven't had to be rented out in the three and a half years that I, you know, since I bought them right after I put that, those tenants in, you know, three years, three years ago, I haven't, I basically haven't, they haven't moved out. Right. But right. it all varies. Some locations, you know, there's a lot more turnover than others. I'm seeing based on like turnover rate here in the capital region, average tenant lasts about a year and a half. And then the other thing is too, as far as vacancy, you know, your apartment is vacant for about a month. Uh, mm -hmm you know, a month, possibly two months, if you're really holding out for a specific person, but about a month is the, you know, the length of vacancy. Is the capital region, how's, how's the capital region doing with rentals? Is this a, a good area to have a rental property in? I don't, I don't, I see people looking for rentals all the time. I'm biased, but I think it's the best place to invest in the country. And uh, there's been numerous, numerous people who have been on podcasts one of which is the CEO of Bigger Pockets. His name's Scott Trench. Mm -hmm. um, I was had the fortunate opportunity to meet him at a conference back in October. And my good friends, Josh and Ali Lupo, some of you who are watching this may know them as the Phi couple here out of Troy. Mm -hmm. um, they're very popular on social media. Uh, but Scott basically had me on his webinar highlighting the Troy real estate market. And he used a lot of, he basically compared Troy to other markets across the country. And what's awesome about upstate New York is things offer great cash flow. They're mm -hmm. affordable to purchase. And, you know, the appreciation is still there. Um, so that has been the awesome piece of the puzzle. So, and I'd say from a rental standpoint, people are always looking for housing here in the area to rent. So I've ha never had any issues as far as vacancies or uh, anything along those lines. You've heard it here first, people buy investment properties in the capital region. That's awesome. So we talked about um, short-term rentals. Is that something that you haven't started yet? Is that a strategy you're thinking about going into in 2024? What's that look like for you? Yeah, we already started it. So I actually have a okay. diner themed Airbnb based out of Mechanicville, New York. You would never think Mechanicville would be a market that people would want to Airbnb and short term rent to. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, I'm, I get a lot of overflow from Saratoga and from SPAC and from uh, you know, people who are looking to frequent up to the track. So even Belmont weekend, I'm already booked and I'm booked at a pretty good rate. So we average about $3,500 a month, just off of our Airbnb in Mechanicville, New York. That's, that's pretty incredible. That's, that's, that's awesome. So future acquisitions, are you, are you like planning to continuously acquire more properties? Is there a, a growth period where you say, Whoa, this is all we can handle right now. How do you do that? Yeah. So, so this year, right now, as we speak, we're in what April 2nd, I'm up to 70 rental units here in the area. Um, with that being said, I want to get to over 100 rental units in the capital region uh, by the end of the year. Um, so on average, we grow our portfolio about 20 units a year, give or take. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. So let's talk flips a little bit because there's people that want to flip properties as well. I'm starting, almost like you just said about the rentals, it seems like more people are doing rentals, but 
and less are doing flips. When I, I got into the industry over 10 years ago, end of 2013, and very few people were holding. Every investor I talked to was flipping, and that's almost reversed. So walk me through uh, the overall strategy for flipping properties. Like, what's the secret sauce for turning a profit? Yeah, for us right now, it's hard to find a good inventory, just like everyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are still flipping. I'd say your seasoned investors are the ones actually flipping a lot. You know, when you were talking that time frame, a lot of beginners and new newbies out there, and it's harder to find a property, especially in the MLS, let alone to flip. So a lot of these take place off market, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on the property. You know, the margins are a lot less than what they were maybe two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so some investors are turned off by that, but those who are doing good amount of volume don't mind it. Um, yeah. So it's still the money's still there. Tell our audience what off market means when you say you properties off market. What does that mean? Yeah, not on Zillow, Realtor.com, or any of those major websites. And not in most times not through a realtor unless it's a pre-listing before the real estate agent posts it on the market. But a lot of it's direct to seller. So dealing with sellers and networking and, and leveraging your network and you know, asking people, just as if you were a full time real estate agent, I know there's a handful on here. They ask me all the time, how do you find off market deals? Well, how do you prospect and how do you find listings? Same mm -hmm. way. So it's just more or less bridging the gap between a buyer and a seller. And uh, that's the success I've had over the last uh, handful of years now. Um, selecting markets for flipping, is that the same as selecting markets for rental or is there a, a variance there? Is there a difference? A little bit different. Um, we'll flip in more suburban areas where let's say Clifton Park, it might, I might be outpriced for Clifton Park on the investment space just because mm -hmm. it's harder to cash flow in that area. Same with Saratoga, but we'll buy flips in those areas, right? So, okay. um, you know, that's kind of what we look for, uh, you know, a place that will sell when I put it out there that I can get multiple offers on. So that could be anywhere in the Capital region as long as it's priced right. Well, I was going to say there is a market for all price ranges right now. I, there, there's a ton of people who are looking for properties in the $200,000 range. Um, and then there's that explosion in the 350 to 400 range. So or the 300 to 400 range, I should say. I mean, those things go multiple offer almost immediately. But um, yeah, there there is a very large market for the $200,000. Um, so do you do you get do those as well? Like, you know. Yeah, I'll give you a perspective. Right now I have a flip that we're working on in Half Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, that one is actually under contract right now. And that was listed for $399. Um, I have, and that was a nice ranch, 1700 square foot home, completely redone. And then I have a project going on right now in Water of Elite, and that one will be listed. You know, my game plan is to probably list that in the, you know, low twos, probably 210, 209, um, maybe even less to get multiple offers. But um, basically, that one's an affordable three bedroom, one and a half bath bungalow right in the city of Water of Elite. So you buy a, I don't know, you buy a, a renovation fixer up or whatever. When when do you determine I just need to cut my losses and sell this because the repair costs are much more than anticipated or calculated? Is there a point? Do you sell it to another investor as is or do you try and just complete the project and, and sell it um, on the resale market? I've only had to do that once and it was a property that I owned in Cohoes and it was one that I got off market. I got it at a good price point and I probably should have sold it. Uh, right after we cleaned it out and got it spruced up a little bit um, and made a profit then. But we tried to see the renovation entirely through. Mm -hmm. um, basically, a lot of unseen items came up while we were going through it. We spent more money on the structure of the property than we could on adding value on the inside. And to tenants, they don't care what your roof for your basement foundation or any of that looks like, right? As long as it's structurally sound, but they care about what's on the inside. And that's where you add your value for the most part with tenants as far as mm -hmm. getting rents up. And at that point, we ended up selling it. We didn't sell it for a loss, but a lot of lost time. We lost, we lost about a year and wow. we held it. We broke even, but still, it was a lesson to be learned to not take on too much more that we could chew. I was at a low of buying property, so I wanted to keep my guys busy. So we took yep. this one on when I probably should have passed up on it or maybe sold it uh, earlier on in the process. Wow, that's, that's scary. And I think that's the scary part for a lot of new investors who want to flip is that they worry about, you know, that repair cost or um, things that just aren't apparent when you buy the property, whether it's a foundation or a buried septic tank or something like that. You just don't know where those things are. 
Um, and then a lot, of course, a lot of the properties you buy, you buy as is. So that's the risk in itself as well, you know? So yeah. um, property selection, what are some of the key characteristics you're looking for um, in a property to determine if it's going to be a potential successful flip? Yeah, something again, like I, I well, for a flip, yeah, the biggest thing is, you know, a lot of cosmetics. I don't want to get into too big structural items uh, for the right. most part. I try to avoid mm -hmm. those situations. So a lot of it's like an outdated home, right? Uh, let's say grandma or grandpa ended up getting themselves into a nursing home and the whole entire house uh, needs to get out of the 80s. You know, we'll mm -hmm. bring it out of the 80s and modernize it and mm -hmm. uh, get rid of the pink and blue bathrooms and, yeah. and put in something more modern. Right. That Yeah, that's sometimes I think some people go into some of these old homes like, the you know, from the 70s, 60s. And they don't know, they don't, I don't think they figure out how much it's going to take to, to put that into modern times. So that could, that could be quite an expense. Is that correct? It is. And, and some people, they don't think about, uh, they also think about maybe having to gut the whole entire place. And a lot of times you might be able to salvage what's there. And that's, that's when you really dig deep and you start gutting walls and you have to sheetrock the entire house and yada, yada. Um, it can add up. And I've seen a few investors kind of go belly up. By doing that they didn't take my advice and say hey look keep that wall keep this just paint do the cosmetics and they went ahead and did the gut renovation and it cost them a lot of time and money so you're you're a realtor so you obviously will list your own flips but let's say um for an, uh, a flipper who does not have a real estate license and he want he he has a realtor that works with him to list his properties how how do they determine the percentage of the purchase that they're going to aim for to make a profit and include a broker's fee in that? I guess it comes down to your bottom line, right? You're figuring yeah. that out with, you know, your real estate agent, what's it's worth, and then, you know, backtrack from there and make sure that you can afford those services. A lot of times, and I even have been doing it recently, a realtor sells me an off-market deal. Sometimes I'll even give it back to that realtor, as crazy as that sounds. But in this market, it's tough to find good inventory. So whatever it takes. So if you're a real estate agent in the Copper region, hearing this podcast and you're have maybe an upcoming listing that you're thinking about selling and it's not going to maybe sit well on the market and it needs that right investor, give me a call because you'll be able to be uh, rewarded tenfold. So Sweet. I got you. <laughs> um, what's, your, what's the average timeline or what's the timeline you should be targeting from purchase to sell on a flip? For me right now, I've been hitting the stride of three months. People are saying, wow, that's crazy. Uh, that should have took longer than that. But my guys have this systematized. I give a lot of credit to the guys that work with me. Um, mm -hmm. We've been doing this quite a bit now and we have a good system in place. We know the materials that we're gonna buy. We know what needs to be done and they hit their stride. Um, most people, it's hard to find good contractors. Luckily, mm -hmm. I have an awesome crew. Um, and with that being said, the average person, probably about six months. Oh, okay, all right. And, and, and how do you keep those projects on track? How do you avoid delays? <laughs> so the biggest thing is, is, the hardest part is material delays. You never know what material. Right now I'm waiting for a five switch uh, for basically a light cover uh, for five switches. They don't sell those <laughs> at Home Depot or Lowe's. So we had to order those waiting at a garage. So those can be your your bigger hiccups in, in time frame. Um, okay. So it's unpredictable sometimes, but being able to prepare and order ahead, that's important. All right, so here's a, here's a trick question. So which renovations add the most value to a house? Like, how do you focus on like, you know, what cosmetic or structural changes you're gonna make to add the kitchens most value and to the house? Huh? Kitchen, kitchens and bathrooms. Kitchens Those are your biggest, and bathrooms. Biggest, biggest spots that you should spend most of your money and make, those, uh, make that the wow factor. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with maybe first appearance um, and you know, that could be front door, uh, common hallway, you know, if it's a rental, but uh, front door, sprucing things up. So it's cosmetically appealing to the eye when you first get in. I know you talked about private money. Talk, do, do you know a lot about the hard money process? I do. Okay. T tell us how that works. What's the hard money process? So basically you would connect yourself with a hard money lender and there's a handful. You Google them, they'll come up. There's even one called Albany Hard Money Lending Group. I'm giving them a plug, I guess, right now for free. There you go. Um, but basically there's a handful that you can, you know, or you can go to your, your local mortgage lender. They may have access to that hard money. And basically the process starts where they're underwriting you as if you're a borrower on a mortgage, right? They're looking at your, you know, your financials, making sure you're accredited, that you're not going to default. 
And a lot of times, depending on the project, they'll uh, require you know percentage down, whether it's towards the actual initial purchase or having money in reserves for repairs and, um, that may come up that you plan on doing. Okay. Um, so it does require some money down where my private money, sometimes it does not. Most times it does not. And then the other case is you also have points and fees that you have to pay. And then there's also most likely an appraisal process where on that purchase, you have to have it appraised um, and they'll walk through it. You'll make a list of repairs that you plan on doing. And then the appraiser will value it at its present state. And then it will come up with an after repair value as well, based on the repairs that you listed off. Is this a New York state licensed appraiser or is this an appraiser within the investment group? I've seen it where it's just been a real estate agent. Uh, it's been someone who just works in the investment group. It's been a variety of things. Okay. But it doesn't have to be a licensed state appraiser, right? Don't quote me on that, but I, I've seen a few situations where it was not. Hey, it's hard money. That's why they call it hard money. <laughs> right. They kind of create their own rules sometimes. Right. Um, That's what I was yeah. saying. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, I know you told me you ran into some structural problems. Is that the biggest challenge you faced in flipping properties coming into unforeseen problems like that? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Yep. Mm -hmm. I try to avoid them at all costs, but sometimes they come up and you have to address them uh, as they come up. What are some of the market trends in flipping right now? Things you see that are trending. It's starting yeah, to happen people, more and more, huh? You, people like the color beige. Uh, that's been a common, common color. It always has been, it's a neutral color that we went through probably 2016 to 2021, the gray era. Right. And then the that kind of got, that kind of got kicked out. And, uh, if you're still using gray in your flips, you are, uh, you you're need behind. to reevaluate things. Yeah. So you're a little bit behind, um, definitely, right? Definitely you, having those neutral colors. You would be about two years behind with the gray, but you know, yeah. there's still, still some people that like gray because. That's what's in all the magazines, the home magazines, they still see gray, but you see, you're yeah. starting to see more beige and different uh, tones of beige, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, kitchen, kitchen countertops and cabinets? What trends do you see there? See there? People like using quartz. It's something that we use. It's easy to clean for the most okay. part. Um, the other thing was, uh, you know, still basic white cabinets are common with maybe a different, you know, color handle to make it pop. Right. Okay. Um, I've also seen some people do, you know, an offset uh, color, like maybe a, you know, lighter green or, you know, some people can still pull the, the gray cabinets as long as there's a nice neutral background and backdrop. So new cabinets or refinishing old cabinets? It depends on the flip. It depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the market. Most times you're putting new cabinets in on our flips. Um, but, you know, depending if there's stuff that can be salvaged and it still won't affect the price point, we can still get you know, a good amount of interest from potential buyers will take that into consideration if we can, you know, save some money. Great, great. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Is there any question that you'd like to cover in with us? I know you do a lot of interviews. I've seen you on the stage at the summit. Why don't you share something with us that I might not have asked? Anything you can think of? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think back to what I said originally, if you're and people all the time ask me, all right, well, how did you become so successful? How can you get your start? And it's having people behind you to support you, whether that's a mentor or someone who's already been doing it. Um, having someone with past experience that you can bounce ideas off of, whether you want to become a full-time real estate agent and scale your business as a realtor, or if you want to go ahead and become an investor, it's the same thing being able to have that mentorship, that guidance, whether you pay for it, whether it's free, however you do it, it's important. And how do people uh, get in touch with you? What's the best way to reach you? Uh, usually through social media or call me. I'm 25 and most people say, oh, you must just like social media and text message, but I'm old school. I'm always driving around. If I'm not driving around, I'm not making money. So I can't always text while I drive, right? So I try to pick up the phone. A lot of times it's a voice conversation. So. My phone number is uh, readily available. If you Google my name, feel free to give me a call or reach out to me on social media. That's great. All right. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you know how uh, the Real Estate Happy Hour weekly goes. You know, we, we put this on Facebook Live, then it'll be floating through Facebook. G Giovanni, you're going to share this on your page as well. When I send you the link, I'll share it with you. We also are on YouTube. Then I create a, um, a vocal podcast as well on your favorite podcast platforms, like, you know, mostly Apple or Android podcast um, and the other podcast platform. I also do reels and shorts, which I share throughout 
the week. You probably saw those, right, Giovanni, with um, I did. Joe Bordeaux. So I do those. And I just try and keep people abreast of what's going on in our industry in various ways. Um, do you have any questions for me, Giovanni? I think I'm all set. I appreciate you having me on here. And I, I, I love watching these. They're great. And uh, it helps me even learn something new every single day. So I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time because I know we're all pretty busy. In fact, when I finish this, I got some showings to go do myself. So, you know, those afternoon, late evening showings. But look here, man. Thanks a lot for coming. And um, you guys know how to reach Giovanni. You know how to reach me. I'll talk to you all later. Giovanni, thank you so much, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Same take care. Bye-bye.